it's my pleasure to introduce you to Tommy Mayberry. I've learned a lot from Tommy over the past few years about this topic, and I'm excited to continue learning from Tommy today. Um, some of you may be aware of our teaching tip on gender pronouns and teaching, which was authored by Tommy. So Tommy Mayberry, who uses the pronouns he, she, and they, is the manager of outreach and recruitment at St. Jerome's University and is an academic drag queen currently finishing their PhD in English language and literature at the University of Waterloo. Tommy is also co-editor of the forthcoming book, Rue Pedagogies of Realness, Essays of RuPaul's Drag Race and Teaching and Learning um, by McFarland 2021, and has presented their academic work and research across Canada and internationally in Oxford, Tokyo, Washington, DC, and Honolulu. So welcome, Tommy. We're all very excited to learn from you today, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you, CTE, so much for having me um, and all of you folks for, for tuning in today. Um, I am going to share my screen and we will get started. And then, of course, as soon as I hit play from start, all of you disappear. And Kristen, can you just confirm for me that this is up in um, full screen for everyone? Yes, everything's looking great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Okay, hi again everyone. Um, so as Kristen said, um, there is a CTE teaching tip sheet called Gender Pronouns in Teaching, and um, I used to work at CTE as an instructional developer, um, and I, on my last day at CTE before I went to join the University of Guelph's Office of Teaching and Learning, I submitted the draft of that tip sheet. So it, um, it was not up when I was still there at Waterloo, um, but it now is up, and um, this entire talk um, is based off of the, the work and research that I put into that draft and, you know, my continued learning and learning and relearning from there. So I'm so excited, so honored and also so humbled to um, be doing this as part of the inclusive instruction series that CTE is launching. Um, as Kristen said, my name is Tommy Mayberry. I use he, she and they pronouns. Um, that's what this talk is about. So if that is sounding, um, you know, a little unclear or why or how I may have three series of pronouns. This is what this talks about. Um, and I am the manager of outreach and recruitment at St. Jerome's University just across the creek, physically on campus. Um, we all are tuning in from different places potentially around the world as well. Um, and so as I start, I do want to share a land story, not about campus, um, but about where I grew up um, and thinking about the land and the connection to the land, because I've been I've been really wrestling and, and trying to reconcile in myself my own connection to land as a white settler scholar. Um, and so this is a photo of the Grand River. There's nothing to see. There's nothing to see. Let me stop sharing. Oh no, Tommy, we see everything. I think some folks are just calling in and it doesn't automatically mute them. So we'll go ahead and mute them, don't worry. I okay. could see the slides on my end, everything is good to go. Okay, I will go back to sharing then. Um, and yes, Kristen and Brianna and Ginny, please interrupt me at any point if tech um, difficulties are happening. Um, one of the wonderful, a little, a little green dot as I go. Um, but we are all good, Brianna? Yep, we're good to go. Okay. Um, so this is a photo of the Grand River um, taken from Highway 86 on a, a bridge there that connects Westmount Rose to um, Winterburn and up toward Guelph and, and sort of Elmira um, on either end of that. And you can see in kind of the middle that red um, rectangle there, and that is the covered bridge in Westmount Rose. Um, and I want to share this picture because the bank that you're looking at on the right hand side is actually Westmount Rose Family Campground. Um, and that's where I grew up. Um, so I would spend um, all of my summers with my parents um, and a bunch of my friends at the, the trailer park who I met, um, you know, for almost my, my entire life. They still have a trailer there and I haven't visited it this summer because of COVID. Um, but before the pools would open, we would put on our river shoes and our bathing suits and we would actually go play in the river. And so growing up, I always had this intense connection to the Grand River and to the land on its bank. And so when I first heard um, the University of Waterloo's and St. Jerome's territorial acknowledgement um, that talks about the Haldeman Tract and talks about how 
That was land promised to the indigenous peoples that was 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. Um, I had this moment of affective whiplash almost where um, it wasn't some imaginary 10 kilometers to me on either side of the Grand River. Um, I grew up playing in those waters. I grew up walking on those banks, um, you know, 10 feet, 10 centimeters um, on, on the, the bank of that. And um, the Grand River always to me has felt like it was mine. Um, and so doing a lot of um, unlearning about my own lived history on this land and doing a lot of relearning um, and learning in general about the land has these two kind of competing histories of the land in my head that I wrestle with. Um, and I want us to keep that in mind as we go through this talk, this idea of competing histories and competing knowledges of what we've learned, how we've learned, um, and how we continue to, to grow um, going forward. Because um, we will have those moments of affective whiplash where we are feeling um, this does not, um, you know, this does not mesh with what I thought I knew or what I thought I believed or what I thought I understood. And so I like starting my talks off with this thing because to me, the acknowledgement in our email signatures that we have and that we open talks with means something very different. Um, and I do also want to acknowledge as well that recently paying attention to um, land acknowledgements in my recruitment work as well with um, future UW students and their support systems, um, the creek that runs through campus is Laurel Creek, which is a tributary of the Grand River. So for us as well, um, working on main campus and across the creek at the university colleges, it's also not some imaginary 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. Our campus is built on the banks of a tributary of the Grand River as well. So um, perhaps we all can think about those competing histories of land as we go. I also want to start off with one more acknowledgement, and that was that you heard um, you heard me say that I'm a white settler scholar. Um, and so I do want to absolutely acknowledge um, two incredible women um, who came before me who are not white women. Um, so Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, maybe you've heard their names before, maybe you've seen their pictures before, um, but these two um, beautiful, proud trans women of color who were also drag queens and are LGBTQ plus activists and heroines. Um, these two in popular culture and a lot of queer and trans history are credited with starting um, the, the revolution in the, the 1960s um, because of what's called the Stonewall Riot, which is the early hours of June 28th, 1969 at the, at the Stonewall Inn, which was a, a gay bar and recreational tavern in Greenwich Village in, in New York City. Um, it was busted up by the cops in a police raid, and that had happened many, many, many times before June 28th in the early hours. But on June 28th, um, Marsha and Sylvia had had enough of the police raids, enough of the oppression, enough of the, the abuse coming from the police. And um, Marsha threw a brick at the cop cars, allegedly, um, or in pop culture memory as well, it was Marsha who threw the brick followed very closely by Sylvia Rivera throwing a bottle at the police officers. And this ignited what has come to be known as the Stonewall Riot or the Stonewall Revolution, which then turned into a march um, down to the precinct the next morning on June 29th, um, fighting for and calling for and demanding for equal rights for all types of um, oppressed people, um, queer, trans, people of color, homeless people, differently abled people as well. Um, that's why we celebrate Pride Month in June, actually, is following um, in the, the footsteps of Marsh and Sylvia. And so I also want to acknowledge as we start this talk that I am a white drag queen. Um, I do visually present um, in my day to day as a white male presenting person, facial hair, um, well, spiked hair as well. But um, I'm able to walk I'm able to walk through the, the halls of the academy and I'm able to walk through this world in this white body very differently um, than um, queer of color and trans of color um, folks out in the world as well. And so I want us to keep that in mind as we go through um, this talk as well, because it is going to be um, at a language level and it is going to be at a um, functional level in teaching and learning. But um, for many of us, this is not a um, not something that happens in the arguably protected walls of the ivory tower um, for us. And it is something that has life or death stakes in it as well. So um, I want to open my talk with um, these connections to land and to my own history and my own ancestors in Marsha and Sylvia. 
our session outcomes today then are that by the end of this talk, we all should be able to define and discuss pronouns, including gender pronouns, as parts of, as parts of speech in English language discourse, history and culture with a knowledgeable, inclusive and respectful vocabulary. We also should be able to identify and implement strategies and resources for positive engagement with gender pronouns in teaching and learning, as well as use pronoun awareness to signal cultures of respect and reflect on whiteness, marginalization, trauma, and continued struggle. So I'm going to take us through a series of questions that I have been asked um, about gender pronouns and about teaching and learning. Um, and the first one is an important one, and it is what is a pronoun? Um, and I do not mean this jokingly. If any of you are feeling like, um, you know, a grammar test is coming where you're going to be asked to identify the eight parts of speech, you're kind of on the right track here because we are going back to basics with those parts of speech. And a pronoun is one of those parts of speech. Um, and Dean Spade, who is a trans activist and a lawyer in the States, um, Dean Spade says that it is a somewhat obscure grammar term after all. So don't worry if you might not pass the identify the eight parts of speech quiz that, you know, theoretically is coming. It's not. Don't worry. I'll stop joking about that. No one likes about um, surprise quizzes being dropped on them. Um, but if you're feeling that like, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you, don't worry. It is an obscure grammar term. It is a grammar term. It's not something that we're always constantly thinking of unless perhaps you are in English language as a discipline like I am. Um, at their core, a pronoun is a part of speech that replaces a noun. And so nouns are people, places, things, ideas, or emotions. And so a pronoun will replace that noun in um, discourse and communication to stand in for that noun so that we can avoid repeating the, the noun multiple times. We can use a pronoun to replace that. And so maybe you've seen a table like this before. Maybe this is something you are thinking about when you were learning an additional language. Um, so thinking about, you know, an Ontario curriculum, um, learning French from grade three to nine, you might have seen these tables where we break them into subject, object, and possessive pronouns. And so these ones should look familiar. He, him, his, she, her, her, and hers, they, them, their, and theirs, and it, it, and its. So what is a gender pronoun then? Well, when a pronoun replaces and stands in for a noun who is a person, because remember, nouns are a person, place, thing, idea, or emotion, so person. When it stands in for a noun who is a person, we are grammatically responsible for aligning the pronoun standing in with that person's gender. And our language itself does dictate this. So pronoun definitionally is a word standing instead of a noun as its substitute or representative. And in the pronoun are to be considered the person number, gender, and case. And so this is coming from Robert Lowe's A Short Introduction to English Grammar with Critical Notes from 1762. And now you're probably thinking 1762, well, aren't we supposed to use contemporary resources? And isn't the rule of thumb, you know, recent contemporary resources in academia would be in the past five to 10 years? This is way past five to 10 years. And the reason why I'm going back to Robert Loth is manifold, actually. Um, Robert Loth historically was a bishop of the Anglican Church in England. Um, so this is something that is coming from an immense position of power and privilege as well. And his mission with the short introduction to English grammar was to tidy up the language, to make it more accessible to the public, to create the rules that would govern the English language in the British Empire. Um, and all of that might sound great as a project, but it of course has the hidden or perhaps not so hidden agenda of tidying up being the equivalent of, or sorry, being synonymous with colonizing um, and turning the language into rules that need to be followed. And if they're not followed are going to be punished and a way to take the English language onto people who don't speak English and create a set of rules to um, abolish their language and input ours. So 1762, you also will think of, um, you know, coming around the time of the American Revolution, definitely predating um, Confederation and the creation of this nation now called Canada. So this is an important period in British history as well, where we're starting to see that language get tidied up and become a colonizing tool as well. And we'll talk more about this as we go. But I wanted to go back to Robert Loth for some of those reasons. 
And so when we look at this table then, and we're thinking about people as nouns, and a pronoun would stand in to replace the name of that person, something really important has to change in this table. And that would be the deletion of this row that has it, it, and its as pronouns, because we would not use it to refer to a person. We would never use it coming from ourselves to refer to a person. It is an incredibly dehumanizing pronoun when we use to refer to people. And there are many cases in politics, social rights, um, legal cases as well, where you'll see the pronoun it um, is used to remove all traces of humanity. Um, so again, thinking about colonization, thinking about ways that um, imperialism has effectively done that, there would be a sinister um, piece around that as well. And it is absolutely not gone from our contemporary as well. Um, you know, coming on the, the shadow of the, the Trump era in, um, in the United States and globally for that matter as well, we saw this taken up a lot in social media to refer to different marginalized and disenfranchised groups of people as well. So not it, never it. So another question I get then when we're thinking about this table and how the they, them, their series of pronouns could refer to people, we get the question, but, and there's always that sort of like, sure, okay, but isn't they plural? And so here's Jen Mannion, who was a, a prof in the States as well. And Jen says that I argue endless battles with well-educated people who think their own grammar school lessons from 40 or 50 years ago preclude them from referring to individual students as they. And what I love about this quotation is this idea that it's well-educated people who are falling on those grammar school lessons from half a century ago, who are actually saying, well, I was taught that they is plural. And uh, sure, I'm not arguing you weren't, but you were taught wrong. Um, or if you were taught correctly, you can unlearn that as well. But this idea that um, referring to individual students as they can not happen because we were taught grammar differently. So Dean Spade as well says that this year, and this year was 2018 when he was writing, um, that his students are working to advocate that our writing faculty stop teaching that the singular pronoun they, them is grammatically incorrect which is a battle Spade says we still have to fight even though the mainstream press has recognized this use. So in 2018 at Spade School, the writing faculty were still teaching that the singular pronoun they, them is grammatically incorrect. So it's not just the grammar school lessons of 40 or 50 years ago that are teaching this. Contemporary writing faculty are or were also teaching this. And when Spade talks about the mainstream press recognizing this use, in 2015, they, as a singular non-binary pronoun, was named word of the year. So now we're getting on to six years ago that this was the word of the year, but it had gained that traction. So then people will say, okay, sure, but isn't they plural still in at least academic and professional writing cultures? Sure, the popular mainstream says that we can use that on social media, but in, in real, cultures of academia and professional writing cultures, they are still plural, right? It was, absolutely. Um, it, in 2017, the Chicago Manual of Style updated to include they as a generic third person singular pronoun to refer to a person whose gender is unknown or irrelevant to the context. And what I love about this quotation in the, in the CSM is that when the gender's unknown, they're saying, use a singular pronoun they, generic third person, but also irrelevant to the context. And I love that because there are very few cases in which knowing or identifying or outing someone's gender is relevant to the context. So that was 2017 where the CSM style or the CSM manual updated. Before 2017, arguably, and in practice, they was plural and would have been corrected editorially in manuscripts. 2019, Merriam-Webster's dictionary updates to have they as a singular indefinite pronoun used to refer to an unknown or unspecified person, to a single person whose gender is intentionally not revealed, and or to a single person whose gender identity is non-binary. So in 2019, we're seeing gender identity come into it as well as non-binary. And then in 2020, so this past year, and actually just almost a, a calendar year ago, because this was in January 2020, the APA, the American Psychological Association, and the MLA, the Modern Language Association, followed suit and updated their style guides as well so that we can stop correcting the use of they as a plural pronoun when someone is using it, um, as you'll see on, on these slides and these definitions. 
An awesome move that happened as well was that the MLA also included themselves as the reflexive pronoun. And so what that does is that further identifies in the English language a way to refer to individuals using the singular they. Because before this move happened, and it still will happen in your own Microsoft Word and your own autocorrect, if you were using they to refer to a singular person and you were using the reflexive pronoun, it would autocorrect to themselves, replacing the F with the V and adding ES to it which of course can further confuse when somebody is talking about one person and you're using a reflexive pronoun themselves. So now we can use this new word, themself, to refer to a singular person as that reflexive pronoun. This is a super important move for sure. Another note that I want to add is that um, local units, local universities, smaller units, smaller groups of people who have communications projects and stuff under them may also have their own writing style or their own brand guides and they can follow suit by knocking out a lot of this gendered language, including those Latinate gender suffixes that we see happening, because as much as people will tell you alumnus is a gender neutral word to refer to, refer to any of our graduates, it is absolutely gendered, and it's absolutely gendered male as well. Um, so we, if we have a style guide that is governing our communications internally and externally, we also can update that. And so for us as teachers, this might be a way where when we're sharing modified writing guides with our classes for how we want them to complete their papers and written projects, we can update those as well. So then I get the question, fine, you know, almost as like exasperation where you're like, okay, fine, fine, fine. But the singular they is at least new, right? And then this kind of really desperate, right? Like it has to be, this whole conversation has to be some neoliberal snowflake social justice warrior kind of project happening in the 2020s. It can't be something that's always been a part of our language, can it? And the answer unfortunately is that it's remarkable that it took until 2015 for it to be a word of the year and then beyond 2015 for academic cultures to catch up because this pronoun has actually been in our language since our middle English stage, you know, perhaps the adolescence of our English language in the 1300s. So in the Wycliffe Bible, and I won't read this in case anybody from the English department who um, can read middle English is here and will hear me mispronounce this, but this quotation would be, each one in their craft is wise. Each one, each individual person in their craft is wise. Importantly, not each one in his craft is wise. There's not a default to the masculine singular here. It's there. And then going to another colonizing document, Oliver Goldsmith's The History of England, 1771, quote, every person who had been punished for seditious libels during the foregoing administration now recovered their liberty and had damages given to them upon those who had decreed their punishment. So again, every individual person singling them out their liberty, them, and their punishment, not his, and not his slash her to be, you know, perpetuating the, the binary there. I could geek out and keep going on this, but in the interest of time, I won't. I will just also let you know that the Bible was a strategic choice to quote here as well. And two things I want to say on the Bible is we always have to remember that English versions of the Bible are translated from a different language to be in English. So there is a mediation involved in that translation process for it. And the book of Genesis, where we get um, Adam and Eve being created, they're created non-binary as well. So even though they're the first man and woman, um, the Genesis story refers to them with the singular they pronoun as well. So um, the Bible can actually be a wonderful tool for fighting the Bible itself when people are quoting that at us to say they don't have to do this because the Bible tells them not to. So I still maybe haven't convinced everybody. Um, however, at that point, there seemed to be a lot of different ways where someone's asking these questions where we get a sense that overwhelmingly, this is a thing, has always been a thing, and there's a way to do it that doesn't cause this cognitive dis dissonance with us. So what are the gender pronouns that people use then? When we talk about people's personal pronouns and gender pronouns, it can be helpful to think of them in series as well as in cases. So adding a couple rows and a couple columns to this table, the subject object possessive pronoun table, we'll see that we can call them series. So he, him, his would be the he series. She, her, hers would be the she series. 
You'll also see that there can be the they series. There can be a Z series, which would be pronounced Z here, here's. There's the V series, which would be V, them, ver. There's also what I call the just my name series, um, where you would use the person's name as the subject pronoun. You would use the person's name as the object pronoun, and you'd use the person's name with apostrophe S as the possessive pronoun. Want to be clear, this table is neither exhaustive nor complete. Um, there are many, 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 many more rows to be added on here and many different types of pronoun series that you'll see um, coming into people's use for how they understand themselves and how they want to be referred to, to be true to their own lived experiences. A couple other notes. Um, some people do use gender neutral pronoun series that might be unfamiliar to us, such as the Z and the V series. That doesn't make them any less real or any less important. But that does give that piece to it where we may be learning new ways to refer to people. Um, you know, the, the platinum rule here is however someone asks you to refer to them, that's how you refer to them. Um, some people's pronominal system is also just their name and not a series of pronouns. So that just my name series is actually not pronouns. So some people may not use pronouns. They may use a pronominal system that's just their names. And so, you know, fun de other definitional one here, you know, this talk is about language as well. So pronominal is an adjective that means relating to and or serving as a pronoun. Um, so a person's pronouns, a person who uses um, that person's name and does not use pronouns, th the name would not be their pronoun. The name would be their pronominal system and the way to use that. Um, and again, if someone says, I don't use pronouns, please use my name, you use their name. Sorry, one more. And you don't say, um, oh, but that's annoying or that's cumbersome to say, Tommy put Tommy's water bottle down on the table so Tommy could take a sip when Tommy was thirsty. Um, if that's how Tommy uses a pronominal system for their name and their identity, that's how you use it. It's not up to you to say that that's cumbersome or annoying, or it would just be easier if you used a pronoun. And some people, of course, use and are open to being referred to by more than one series of pronouns. And so I like to share this example of me um, because I open my um, talk and I have my pronouns everywhere. Um, and this is twofold. This is so that people know how they can respectfully refer to me when speaking about me in the third person. But it's also so I can signal um, how my identity and my own awareness of um, these cultures of respect make me a person who might be an ally or accomplice for someone. Um, so these three pictures are all me. The picture on the far left is one that I've recently added to my to my work um, and my talks because um, my grandmother passed away at the very beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic. And when I was actually in, in Hawaii at a conference um, when she passed away. And so when we came home, all my cousins and aunts and uncles in the funeral home had all of our old photo albums across all of the families together and they were going through them. And my family had found this photo of me um, at Halloween when I was, I think, seven. Um, and they all were so excited to find this photo. And I don't even remember this, but I went up to my mom and I asked her, you know, for the story behind this photo. And she said, all I remember is that Halloween, you asked to just be a lady. Um, so this is perhaps more my mom's visual <laughs> interpretation of just a lady than it is mine. Um, but this photo I, I had perhaps forgotten was a part of my own um, lived history as well as a queer and trans person that very early on um, I was um, understanding and embodying my identity differently. These two photos, the one in the middle and then the one on the right, these are the ones that often now make their way into my, um, my headshot and my professional profile pictures as well, the two of them together, um, because I do live with the pronoun series he. Um, people can use that series to refer to me. It may be the default um, based on assumptions they're making about me, but that's no less true to my lived experiences. Um, but also when I'm in drag and sometimes even when I'm not in drag, uh, the she series of pronouns um, feels like me. Um, it feels like that's who I am and, and how I'm supposed to be. And there are many instances where people will meet me in drag for the first time and their default and their assumptions tend to be the, um, the she series of pronouns. Um, and then I do also live with the, the they series as well as a, a singular um, non-binary pronoun, um, something when I write about or talk about myself in the third person, um, I will to a they.
as well. That feels more accurate and true to my lived experience in, you know, for example, an abstract or a bio um, that I've written about myself um, to include my, my pronouns, but then when I'm replacing my name to use the they as well. Um, and I do want you folks to know as well, please do feel free in this talk to ask me any questions you have about my three series, about my lived experience. Um, this is not a practice that you are, um, that is responsible to do to queer and trans people who you meet in work or um, or in your, your daily social um, interactions. However, for this talk, if there is a question that you were wanting to ask or, or something that you're curious about um, within the safer space of the virtual um, classroom or environment we're creating here, I'm very happy um, to be vulnerable and to model that vulnerability and to share some of that. But my asterisk is always, um, that's not an activity or um, something that's appropriate to do to queer and trans people who you meet. Um, you can ask if you can ask. Um, but if you are told, no, I'm, I'm not a teacher, it's not my responsibility, or um, I'm not going to engage in that discussion, um, respect that because um, not every queer and trans person and not every person who has a marginalized um, identity and lived experience is um, responsible um, for teaching us and helping us in our learning and unlearning and relearning. Um, but today I, I want to be um, and will be. So connecting and taking all of this to teaching and learning, we can foster inclusivity in our teaching and learning with gender pronouns. And there are two key ways that we can do this. And the first is by creating and maintaining an inviting space around us in teachers, as teachers. And the second is modeling. modeling. So literally embodying and putting that forward. And with both of these, we need to be intentional and meaningful. So I want to share two quotations with you by two um, powerhouse American feminist um, thinkers who um, these quotations really guide me in my own um, anti-oppressive teaching work and my own understanding about um, anti-racism, um, decolonization and equity, diversity, and inclusivity across the academy. And the first one is from Ad Adrienne Rich, who says, quote, when someone with the authority of a teacher describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. Yet you know you exist, and others like you, that this is a game with mirrors. It takes some strength of soul, and not just individual strength, but collective understanding, to resist this void, this non-being into which you are thrust, and to stand up demanding to be seen and heard. And Toni Morrison once said, quote, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not just a grab bag candy game. And you'll notice that I have um, bolded and put in green the word game in each of these quotations. And what strikes me when I look at these two quotations together is the way that each of Rich and Morrison are talking about um, the game of um, colonization and the game of capitalism and the game of these structural oppressive authority figures. For Rich, it's a game with mirrors where we're as teachers showing a world that may not include everyone or that may invalidate certain identities um, or that may have triggers in it or that may minimize or erase people. And that game with mirrors is definitely um, a colonizing tool. And for Morrison, it's a grab bag candy game about who has the ability, the privilege, the reach of an arm to grab more candy faster than someone else in this game. Um, and both of them are clocking this game and the structure of this imperialist colonizing um, system that is the academy, um, that is this place where we still, to this day, you know, in, in the future as well, in the next couple of days, you know, are marking our students, are setting up these parameters of success and these different measures as well. Um, and so game for me in these is a really important thing to remember that as much as we might talk about gamifying the classroom and ways that we can bring in fun and learning and pop culture, um, there are other more sinister games that can be at play as well. And on this idea of that, that sinisterness as well, I do want to share some stats as well um, to put this into a, a realistic context within Canada as well, as well as the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, from their Society at a Glance 2019 study. Um, so within Canada and other of these OECD countries, 
nearly one in three individuals identifying as LGBT, LGBTQIA2S plus report experiencing discrimination. This is the part of a live workshop, and if you're seeing multiple cells on the screen, you can do it digitally as well, where I would do that thing where I say, look to your left and look to your right. Between the three of you, um, one of you would be experiencing discrimination for being um, somebody who identifies as LGBTQIA2S+. Not, not a big population um, to, to be in where two of you might be free from that. Um, their report also notes that social acceptance of sexual and gender minorities by Canadian citizens is approximately half of the population surveyed. And this statistic resonates with me as well because um, as somebody living in Canada, or as all of us um, who are living in Canada and we're looking south at the states during the first and second um, most recent in memory presidential elections, we were shocked by this divide in nearly half of the country. And we fall into this false narrative of thinking that we do better in Canada, um, that we're different from the states, that we don't have that divide. And yet the Society at a Glance um, study from 2019 says that for sexual and gender minorities, um, that's the reality, um, that social acceptance is for half, for half of us in this country. And then this last one is the one that really, really, um, really, really um, drives this home with the sinisterness and, and the life or death pieces is that um, the, the study found that 44% of respondents said they would accept a child who expressed themselves differently from the sex to which they are assigned at birth, which means that 56% of the respondents said that if their kid told them, I'm not the sex that was assigned to me when I was born, they would not be accepted. Um, and as university teachers and people working in the academy, we are getting these kids when they're 17, 18, 19 years old, um, when they're figuring themselves out, when they're um, learning about different identities and identity categories. And so knowing that um, over, over half of people would not accept their kid if they expressed themselves differently from that sex which they were assigned at birth, um, that is a huge statistic. And it's a, a terrifying statistic as well to, to think of this acceptance from one's own parents um, and the power of that sex assignation at birth that happens when a doctor looks between someone's legs and says, this is your script for life between one or two. So Spade says, being called by what you go by rather than being misgendered and misnamed can reduce anxiety, reduce depression and reduce suicidality. These things need to be things that we are forefronting as our teachers, um, especially in a pandemic, but also especially not in a pandemic. Um, during our um, during our normal times or our regular times or whatever it is where um, we have students who just simply by calling them by what they go by can make their engagement in the spaces of our classrooms and in the assignments they're doing with and for us less anxiety inducing, less conducive toward depression and less likely for them to take their own life. So how do we begin to do this? How do we begin to move toward this place where we can reduce anxiety, depression, and suicidality in our students? Again, that's by modeling our own pronouns and pronominal systems and by transparently inviting others to do so as well. So we can include them in our email signatures. Um, so here's a screenshot of mine. It's a big email signature. I know there's a lot going on in all different facets of my professional identity, but you'll see near the bottom, um, just above um, where I have my Facebook and my Twitter, you'll see pronouns and then you'll see he, she, and they. And that word pronoun is actually hyperlinked to the CTE teaching tip um, on gender pronouns and teaching as well. So that if someone were to, um, in my email signature correspondence, see that and not know what it meant, they could click that and they could do a little research and, and learning on their own. Zoom um, does not yet let us actually put pronouns as part of this script for it. However, if you write as your first name, your first and last name, and then as your last name, put your pronouns, it'll show up um, looking like your first and last name and your pronouns together. So you could do that through digital um, engagements as well. You also can do, and you can have your students do, um, Bitmojis. 
Now, the Bitmoji app does not let you combine multiple series of pronouns. Um, so I needed four <laughs> to show those between the, the two of those. Um, however, you could you could create a Bitmoji avatar that has you know the, the pointing up at the pronoun series you use. You could encourage your students to create them. That way they also can create a different avatar that doesn't have to look like them as well if they're gonna be off camera in your um, online classes. Um, social media, um, since most of us are um, easily Googleable in the academy, um, even in just a, a staff listing page for that. If you're on social media, you can include your pronouns there as well. Business cards in the physical world. Um, I started at St. Jerome's April 6, 2020, so I'm coming up on a year, but I also started right at the beginning of the pandemic, so I don't have SJU ones to show yet, but there's a blast from the past with the one when I worked at CTE, um, which was, um, it was actually at CTE with my colleagues there who were able to get right up through the Senate, um, the pronoun piece added as an optional part of the, the business card. And optional is important because this should never be mandatory. Um, someone should never have to share their pronouns or their pronominal system. Um, we'll get into that in a moment as well and in, in, in the Q&A, but it does need to be an optional piece. And so the Waterloo Business Card template has it as optional for that. When I left CTE and went to um, the Teaching Center at the University of Guelph, I used the Waterloo model um, for Guelph's business cards, and it was a much faster process since just up the street in one of the tri-universities, they were already doing it, but I was able to get the pronouns on the, the cards as well. And so when the day comes to add, um, or when the day comes for me to order, my manager of outreach and recruitment SJU business cards, I will be putting the, my pronouns on them as well. Um, I also don't have a door. Um, so in the physical world, our offices and our doors, um, I don't have a door at, well, I do. I have an office at St. Jerome's, but it has someone else's name on it and I haven't spent any time in there. So this is a, a photo of my door um, from Day Hall when I was working at Guelph and you'll see it has a lot of colors and a lot of things going on it. But that door wheel as well, which is something um, that I had um, taken with me from CTE when I went to Guelph, um, does include my pronouns there. So if someone were coming by my physical workspace and hadn't met me, they're still able to see my pronouns and know that it is potentially a safer um, space for them, that I'm an ally and an accomplice, um, but also how they can refer to me respectfully. They, they know um, which pronoun series um, they can use um, when referring to me. And then also those bios that I was saying about as well. So here's a St. Jerome's piece for you. And for all of my St. Jerome's folks who are on the, the call as well, um, I worked with our, our director of human resources, Michelle, um, to have the pronoun piece added as an optional one to our um, web templates where our um, headshots show up as well as our other identifying information so that they're um, front and center there when, when people would see us as well. And then um, any external or outward facing pieces where your name and contact info would show up. So this is the back of our view book for St. Jerome's, where you'll see contact us, future student advice, Tommy Mayberry, manager outreach and recruitment, and then my pronouns there. So that future students and their support systems, um, when they see who they're gonna contact for future student advice, um, they're able to know my pronouns. And again, that signal that I, I might be an ally and accomplice for them as well. For those of you who have the PDF or are going to ask for a copy of the PDF, um, because I did the fun fancy thing where these animated in, this slide is completely non-legible to go through. So each of the photos does appear as their own slide at the end um, for future reference as well. So modeling, to recap that piece. Share your pronouns or your pronominal system if you're comfortable in your teaching and learning activities. This could look like including them by your name on your introductory slides for the daily lesson. This could look like including them out loud when you first introduce yourself to your students or to new groups of people. This could be pronoun buttons or pronoun badges in the physical world. Um, so using a button maker or ordering them, you can have those as well at conferences or name tags or those sort of pieces. Um, in the digital world, they could be pronoun suffixes like on Zoom or Bitmojis. Um, put them in your email signature, on your business cards, and there are tons of ways where you can um, model um, um, gender pronouns in teaching and learning. Um, I do want to put a note um, that another way to do this is to use the singular they as the default for others when you're referring to them to other people in the third person. And I want to note this is not perfect, so not everybody will identify or use a, um, a singular they pronoun, and that's okay. 
but it's more inclusive to um, default to a singular they than it is to default to he slash she or to just default to um, one binary pronoun. So it's not perfect. Um, and we probably won't ever get to a point where we are perfect in the language, where everything is clean and tidy and remember colonized for that. Um, but it's more inclusive to do this. And it's that powerful signal. And again, all of this comes back to intentionality and transparency. So this isn't something just to do where you're like, oh, Tommy said I should do this, so I'm going to. We need to think meaningfully about it. We need to be transparent about why we're doing it, how we're doing it. We need to tell our students that they don't have to do it. We need to make sure that our colleagues also are not feeling pressured to do it because we're doing it. That this is something that is part of our own individual and collective unlearning, relearning, and learning in general. And so this is pronoun awareness. So Spade says that we can use pronoun awareness as a way to signal a culture of respect. And if we explain this to folks really clearly, it will do the job we want it to and make the group spaces easier for people to participate in and build skills in each of us to make less assumptions about each other. Jack Halverson, one of the leading um, gender cultural studies and transgender studies scholars, he says, I wish more people would behave like my partner's son and simply ask politely and without judgment what pronoun an individual prefers. And Jack says, I also wish more people would use a pronoun system based on gender and not on sex, based on comfort rather than biology, based on the presumption that there are many gendered bodies in the world and male and female do not even begin the hard work of classifying them. So to wrap up, I want us to be caring, but I also want us to be careful. So two types of care are happening here. And I want to double or I guess triple down on this caring that those of us who are working in the academy, whether we are teachers or whether we are um, staff or whether we are somewhere in between anyone who's working in the academy, we have a duty of care to our students, um, to the, the students who are paying tuition and who are coming to our spaces to learn and grow. We have a duty of care and that means to be caring and careful. And when I say careful, we need to remember, and if we didn't know, we need to know and learn that queer, trans, and intersex bodies are medicalized bodies. They have been pathologized bodies. Queer bodies out of these three, out of queer, trans, and intersex bodies, queer bodies are the ones that are now perhaps arguably um, the least medicalized um, and the least pathologized. However, trans bodies are still incredibly connected to Western medicine, to surgeries, to hormones, to um, invasive surgeries and, and procedures as well for that, as well as then the cultural stigma of um, if you don't have surgeries, you're not a real trans person, which is just crap. Um, but that medicalization is connected incredibly to them. And intersex bodies, bodies that um, are not easily at the genital level put into a male or female binary category at birth, often are operated upon um, shortly after birth to physically turn that baby into a binary male or a binary female anatomical body. And then their script for life is um, completely medicalized. So when I talk about being careful, I'm talking about things like trauma and re-traumatization that can happen through something as small as a pronoun. We were talking about this earlier as well with those statistics from the OECD report and also around anxiety, depression, and suicidality. Um, but these bodies um, have these impressively heavy traumatic histories um, that are very contemporary, but also can be historical as part of the, the communities as well. So being aware that this is a piece of this conversation as work, it's not something that is just an easy, quick fix. My pronouns are my business card and I'm good to go. Also, as I talked about by um, acknowledging my white body and by talking about and sharing the history of Marsha and Sylvia, um, this is completely connected to race and to whiteness and to marginalization and to struggle. Um, I know these things can be difficult to hear when we talk about white feminism as problematic and when we talk about white gay rights as problematic, um, but Laverne Cox did say, um, where are we as a community over 45 years after the Stonewall Rebellion, Sylvia Rivera warned us about becoming a movement that was only for white middle-class people. And 45 years later, the most marginalized of our communities are still struggling. 
It's actually 51 years later now. Um, last June um, 28th, and sorry, two Junes ago was the, the 50th, the half centennial. Um, this June coming up will be 52 years since Marcia and Sylvia ignited um, that, that revolution for it. And if you're thinking, you know, perhaps it's just with recent pride parades, um, Sylvia Rivera in 1971, so two years after the raid, was booed off the stage by a bunch of gay white people because she was a homeless Latinx trans person and they didn't think that she belonged in their space. So that's how quickly these women of color, these trans women of color, these drag queens of color were kicked out by white middle class people from the revolution that they started. So when we're reflecting on whiteness and marginalization and struggle, this is completely connected and tied to this as well. It is so much easier for those of us who walk around this world in the academy in white bodies to include our pronouns and think that we are doing something fantastic. And we can be doing something fantastic, but we need to be caring and we need to be careful and we need to be constantly learning, unlearning and relearning. For example, this past June was the first time that St. Jerome's University flew any version of the pride flag during pride month and it was not if you go to twitter and if you follow some of the posts in in the catholic times it was not without controversy um, however we as an institution knew that we needed to learn more about the history of the flag and where it came from and what it represents and where it's going and so what we ended up deciding as a community at saint jerome's was that the progress pride flag would be the one that we would order and the one that we would fly for the month of June. And so this flag might look different to you because when we think of the pride flag, we think of the six bar rainbow banner flag. And this one has those five bars to the left of it that are an arrowhead pointing to the right, metaphorically pointing to the future. And the white, the, um, the powder pink and the baby blue are the three bars of the trans pride flag. And the brown and the black are bars of the BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color flag. And so this flag was created recently, about five years ago, as a fundraising project to look at that intersectionality in the community at large and to not have it be something that easily can fall to a kind of white, gay, exclusive celebration of identity, but something that's about progress, something that's about looking into the future and remembering those who came before us and those who have compounding intersections of marginalization that make it that much more difficult for them to walk through this world and be included and that much more at risk of that anxiety, depression, and suicidality in the spaces we create. So thank you. Thank you for um, coming to this talk. Thank you for listening to me and thank you in advance for engaging in the Q&A. Um, I like to end with these three photos of my dog, Sam, who um, is actually here on the floor crying because I'm not paying attention to him. Um, but maybe you're feeling like one of these three Sams. Maybe you're the Sam on the left who's kind of just coming up for air at this point and feeling like that was a lot, that was heavy. Um, I don't know if I have a question yet. Maybe it's still percolating. That's fantastic. Maybe you're the Sam in the middle who's feeling alert, but still curious about the goings on. Or maybe you're the Sam on the right who's got your bow tie on, you're dressed, you're ready to go. All of these are fantastic. And I look forward to engaging with you in the, the Q&A to follow. So thank you again so much, everyone. <laughs>